President Mlangagwa has appointed a commission to look into the post-election violence that took place on August 1. The commission will investigate exactly what happened on that tragic day that left at least six Zimbabweans dead. Well, this is a good move by ED, right? Well, not everyone agrees. And this was the big debate this last week. Some think the commission is not independent enough. Some say it's not asking all the right questions. Some say we don't need a commission at all. Let's take a look. It's a seven-member team. It will be led by the former president of South Africa, Khalima Montlante. Of these seven members, three are local. Here are the other foreign members. We have Chief Emeka Anyauku, a former Secretary General of the Commonwealth. We have a military man, retired former Tanzanian General Davis Mamunyange. We have Rodney Dixon of the United Kingdom, an international human rights lawyer who has been involved in this sort of inquiry before. Now, there wasn't too much controversy about the foreign commissioners, but there's a lot of talk about the local ones. Vimbai Nyemba is a top lawyer, the former president of the Law Society in Zimbabwe. Not much controversy over there. But then you have Lavmo Maduku. A lot of people in the opposition aren't too big fans of this man. He's one of the country's top constitutional lawyers. Maybe even the best there is. But because he was a candidate in the election, some people feel he's an interested party. And the fact that he has spoken against the MDC's role in the violence only made it worse. Add to the fact that he was the lawyer for Togozani Kupe during the legal battle with Chamisa and MDC supporters are seeing red. The most controversial pick is Charity Manieruke, a UZ political science lecturer. She's a big supporter of ZANU-PF and she owns it. So a lot of people are asking questions about this. Well, we don't know what she's doing there, but this is a panel with a former president, an ex-army general, the former head of the Commonwealth, a top international human rights lawyer. Can all these guys be swayed by Charity Manieruke all on her own? Sounds like a bit of a stretch, but still... This is Zimbabwe. We have major trust issues. Just to give everybody confidence, maybe Edi should have replaced her with a more neutral person, like a religious leader or someone. Then the commission can get on with the job without all this talk. And that job is clear. They have these terms of reference. One, what caused the violent protests and who is behind them? Two, how did the cops handle the protests? And three, why was the army deployed? Was the degree of force they used necessary? The commission has the power to investigate any issue to do with what happened on August 1. So they have a lot of powers to ask a lot of people a lot of questions. And our expectations are simple. We want the truth. Nothing more. The victims deserve the truth. The whole nation too. For our country to move forward, we need this to be done right. We've had a lot of commissions in the past. A lot of them have come and gone. We never saw the reports. So this is another chance for the president to show that he is doing stuff differently. So ED has just started off his term in office. This is what he's always wanted, his own mandate. Now back in June, he said he was just finishing Mugabe's term. He said, once I get my own mandate, I'll be able to follow my own vision. Well, that mandate is here. His supporters say he has hit the ground running. We wonder whether we'll hear a lot about 100-day targets again this time. Now it's a hard sell. Unless there are tangible differences and changes, for example, less bank queues and cash in the banks, a lot of people will always say he could have done more. Yes. It's not a lot of time to change everything, but expectations are high. But a lot can be done in 100 days. Look at Ethiopia. In April, Abiy Ahmed took over as Prime Minister. Now, this was a country that had seen a lot of protests, cash shortages and state-sponsored killings. The country was fighting with neighbours. There was a lot of tension between different ethnic groups. Abiy is working on all of that and finding real solutions. There was bad blood with Eritrea. Abiy has made peace. For the longest time, Egypt and Ethiopia have been beefing about how much water they get from the Nile. Abiy has made peace there too. He has changed a lot of laws. The ruling party there controls all of the seats in parliament. All of them. But Abiy is opening up the political space. Ethiopia is one of the most closed and controlled economies in Africa. Now Abiy is inviting investors to buy shares in Ethiopian state companies. He's changing foreign currency laws too. The World Bank is so happy with what he's doing over there that they're giving him a billion bucks for the budget. The UAE is putting in three billion. They deposited a billion dollars into Ethiopia Central Bank to ease cash shortages. Oh, and Abiy is just 42. Now here in Zimbabwe, a few members of the ruling party are floating with the idea of raising the presidential age limit. Their argument is that you can't have a mature leader at that age. Well, there you go. Abiy is succeeding where other older leaders have failed. What people ultimately care about are results and ideas. If they had raised the age limits for leadership over there, Abiy would have never made it. But it's not been easy for him too. The same day that someone threw a grenade at E.D. in Blauayo, the same happened to Abiy at a rally. Just as Mlangagwa did here, Abiy quickly came out in the public to reassure everyone that he was in control. Here's the thing, 
Abi's a bit of a rock star with Ethiopians right now. They see the change, they can feel it. Yes, the country still has a lot to deal with. There are over 90 ethnic groups. The economy is doing great, but a lot of people are still poor. Literacy is very low. But Ethiopians are teaching us one big lesson. Yes, you can't fix all your problems in 100 days, but you can make a difference. Changing presidents is a big deal here in Zimbabwe. It's been 30 years after independence and we're just talking about the Second Republic. But over in Australia, they've lost count. Do they even have big inaugurations? They'd have those every few months. Let me explain. Now, while a lot of countries have four or five year terms between elections, in Australia, elections come every three years, but prime ministers hardly last that long anyway. John Howard was the last prime minister to serve a full term between 2004 and 2007. In the last 10 years, they've changed prime ministers six times. Yes, six times. These guys are always stabbing each other in the back. They have compulsory voting down there. Australia is one of just 12 countries in the world that has mandatory voting laws. If you don't vote, you get fined 15 bucks. All these leadership changes happen so many times that Australians don't even know who their leader is. Now check this. There's even a dedicated Twitter account that documents who is in charge on a half-hourly basis. Now the new Prime Minister down under, Scott Morrison, in April this year, only 54% of Australians knew who he was. Now let's try and understand how this works. In Australia, they have two main parties. The Liberals and Nationals are in power. Labour is in the opposition. They fight a lot even inside their own parties. Lately, they've been fighting over energy issues. Yes, energy. Long story, but it's a battle between those supporting renewable energy and those supporting the big coal companies. So now you have people using this whole thing to get rid of the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. Now Turnbull was up against another guy, Peter Dutton. So Turnbull quit. His treasurer, Morrison, took over and won the battle against Dutton in Parliament. But now they're saying Morrison won't last long either. All these guys are from the same party. It's crazy. And you thought that we were the kings of factionalism. Six leaders in 10 years. How much change is enough? You have to wonder. This is one country that we have a lot of ties with. Just recently, it was reported that an Australian company has been given a deal to explore for gas in Zimbabwe, up in the Zambezi Valley. We have a lot of Aussie firms here too. Well, we will take their investment, but they can keep their confusing politics.